workshop on uh, navigating finding a lab and how to find a good advisor. Uh, my name is Daniel Makaya. I'm a fifth year student in the HST program. Um, and I'm very delighted to um, help you along this, this, this journey. Uh, something that's very important, um, the decision that you have to make that's going to um, affect your basically your, your time here in grad school. So um, to help you along this decision today, I have a short presentation that I'm going to give you with a lot of the factors to consider when finding an advisor in a lab. And also, we're joined today by, by three wonderful faculty panelists. Um, professor Karen Wilcox um, is a professor in astronautics and, and aeronautics in the Astrospace Computational Design Laboratory at MIT. She is also co-director of the MIT Center for Computational Engineering and associate head of the Department of Aeronautics and Astronautics. Uh, Dr. Myron Spector is a professor of orthopedic surgery and biomaterials at Brigham and Women's Hospital and Harvard Medical School. He's also an affiliated faculty um, with Health Science Technology, and um, he is also a senior lecturer in mechanical engineering. And uh, Professor Karen Polensky is the Peter de Flores Professor of Regional and Political Economy in the Department of Urban Studies and Planning um, at MIT, and is the director of the Multi-Regional Planning Research. Okay, so my presentation will tell you how to find a lab. It's three somewhat easy steps. Um, they're very easy conceptually, and then... So the, the three steps are, one, how do you find out who's out there? Uh, what professors are you going to be working for? And where are they in, in this campus in Boston, Cambridge, etc.? Uh, what is there to consider? So what are the factors that actually go into making this very important decision? And then finally, what do I say? How do I start this conversation with the faculty when I sit, when I think that I want to potentially join their lab? Um, I have two handouts for you, both um, of which are basically, uh, they have to do with this, with this presentation. They're a condensed version of the information in this presentation, so if you don't take notes right now, that's, that's okay. And there's, um, also a pros and cons of different advising styles sheet that was made by the GSC um, a number of years ago that I'm going to make reference to in this, in this presentation so you can then look back at it later. Okay, so first the resources. So how do you find a PI with your interests? Um, one is a web search. So you could search the departmental websites, you could search um, news announcements, you could even, uh, there are websites such as Harvard Catalyst um, and that website brings together faculty throughout all of Harvard and MIT and all of the medical uh, schools if you're more interested in that medical focused research. Um, so really, the internet's a very powerful tool and I believe that you could find pretty much most of the information that you need on there. It's just sometimes it's a little bit too much and can get overwhelming. So another place to look um, is within your department. So if you go to departmental seminars, if you have any weekly seminars or any meetings that you'll be able to get some exposure to faculty, uh, the same thing with course lecturers. A number of courses not only have faculty that, that do research, but also invite other faculty that may speak a little bit about their research, and you may want to talk with them after class to actually see if, if some of these things are, are in line with, um, with what you're interested in. And finally, one of the most important things is, that is word of mouth. Um, if you're interested in doing something with lasers and you're in um, ECS, you know, there are probably a number of other people in your department who are working with lasers, and they'll be able to point you in the direction of all the faculty that they know who are working in that area. So really, your peers are one of the best sources of information when, when it comes to this. The considerations part. Now this is, is something that's gonna be very specific to you. So some people weigh things highly, um, more highly than others. So for example, the, the, fa the main factors that should go into deciding which lab to join uh, one is the, the PI, the principal investigator, and um, you know, we're very fortunate to have a number of PIs on, on, on this panel, and they're going to speak a little bit, a little bit more about this. Um, but I'll get back to the PI in a, in a second, because I have, for, for example, that, that she has a number of the pros and cons. I just want to highlight um, a couple things in there. But the, I, I want to talk about the, the other three right now. Uh, one is the research project. So, for one thing, is the research project interesting to you? Is it something that you're passionate about? Or do you just not really know what you're interested in and you feel like you want to 
start exploring a, a different area, or you know, you, you you first need to figure out what type of research you want to work on um, if you don't already have that that interest um, inside of you. The other thing is think about what techniques and tools you're going to be learning when you actually embark on this uh, on this project. Um, sometimes you may think something is, is very interesting, um, but then you realize that you may have to work with human subjects or animals or class three lasers or something that maybe you're not really wanting to, to, to work with. Or maybe that's, that's what you really want to work with. Maybe the whole point of you coming here was really to work with people and to do more clinically focused work. And so you want to choose a project that you will see yourself um, working with people directly um, in, in whatever, whatever way possible. Another thing that, that actually we're very fortunate to have here is a lot of industry academic uh, or, in, or academic government collaborations. So there are a number of labs around campus that have a direct project with um, a specific company in, in industry or with a specific government grant or government organization, you know, US Army, and uh, maybe that's of interest to you. Or another thing to really consider, even above a, a level above all that, is is this a new project or is this something that's already existing? Because that's also going to change the, the way that, that, that you work on it. If it's a brand new project, there's no one in the lab with expertise really on what you're doing. Um, but you'll be a pioneer in that field and then everyone who comes after you on that project will be, okay, you know, this was you know, the person who really started it. Um, or as an established project, you already have a solid knowledge base behind what the project is actually all about, and there are a lot of people to help you. Um, that's something that's a very personal thing. Some people like the extra freedom, some people don't. Uh, the lab environment is another important thing to consider. Is this a 9 to 5 lab, a 5 to 9 lab, a 24 hour a day lab? Basically, chances are when you step into a lab, there's going to be a culture. And the best way to determine that culture is to talk with the graduate students in that lab and see what's going on. Because chances are you will conform to the standards of the lab, not the other way around. So if everyone comes in at you know, 11 PM and that's like the standard of practice, chances are you might feel pressure to, to, to do that. Or that just might be the way that, that things are done. And you'll, you, you may end up fitting into that, into that realm. Um, also, is the lab con collaborative. And you could, you could kind of get a sense of this when, you, when you're actually talking with the students and the faculty. Are you working on projects that have some overlap or are you all working on such independent things that you really don't speak to the person next to you except for you know, talking about what's on NPR or PhD comments. Uh, but that's, th those are all things that are very you know, personal considerations. Uh, the other thing is, is funding. Um, do you have your own funding? That, that sort of gives you a really good you know, foot in the door to say, I want to work on this project or I want to you know, work for this lab because really with grants being so hard to come by now and funding for students being a, a very big issue, the more grants you apply to, the more freedom you're going to have. So that's actually a very important takeaway message in general for this. Apply to as many fellowships and grants as you can on your own because it's only going to help you. If not just for the experience or if, even if you get the grants, it'll help you in your career later because that's going to be a line on your resume, your CV, showing that you could convince other people that you do good work and that um, you could really you know, put forth an idea and, and persuade others. Yeah. So back to the, to the advisor. So the, the GSC, um, and you, you have this in your hand up, the GSC every year runs a uh, graduate life survey. And the number one thing that they found is correlated to grad student happiness is their relation with their advisor. So this is kind of an important you know, thing to, to, to consider when you're, when you're looking at it. Now, so, to, so you, you can all look at this you know, in detail when you're, when you're making these decisions, but you, you have to figure um, out whether you want an advising style that's hands-on or hands-off. So established and, and, and junior faculty, and that, that's going to be the, uh, it's also tied into to hands-on and, and hands-off. But really, if you're in a place where, where you're not given much guidance, and you're expected to perform and just know how to do stuff and find things out on, on your own, but 
that's not the way that you work, that's not going to be a good fit at all. Um, so if you need that extra support, if you need weekly meetings, if you need constant feedback, you might actually want to go for someone who's more junior in their faculty because they're going to be very invested in the exact work that you're doing because it's going to be very important later on when they are, are you know, looking to publish high impact papers and, and looking to, to push um, both your career and their career forward. Um, if you like more of a hands-off style where you like to just go and, and tinker with things and figure things out, not have anyone else tell you what to do, you know, then maybe going to a more established lab where the, where the PI has many projects going on and they're all you know, fundraising and, and you know, talking about the work and not spending as much time necessarily with you, but you have the opportunity to have almost complete freedom in your research. You have a general topic and you can just fly with it and you tell them once a month you know, what you're doing and they say, okay, great, you know, keep up the good work and stuff. That, that works for some people, that doesn't work for all, so that's, that's an important point. A uh, couple more things is, is PI famous that might also tie into whether or not you see them, uh, but will give you potentially more prestige when you leave the lab. If you come from a very um, esteemed faculty member, they're going to see that on your on your on your resume, your CV, and you say, "Oh, okay, this person came from this lab," uh, and that might also play into what career you want to choose afterwards. Because there are some labs that are. Uh, more heavily connected in certain industries or certain career tracks than others. There are some labs that most of the people who graduate go on to something academic. Now this, this is kind of changing with the number of alternative career paths that are, that are being pushed forward now um, because of just the situation in, in general with, with getting um, faculty positions. But you know, if there's a lab that has a very strong connection with industry and you're thinking about going into industry, that might mean something because then you're going to be able to network with a lot of people who may be your future employers, colleagues, etc. So, um, a few other points are expertise and in your interests. This, this actually is a point that, that I, I didn't necessarily consider until I saw one of my friends go through this where you have this huge passion for something. You know exactly what you want to do, but it's so specific, it's so narrow that really Despite all of the researchers at MIT, there's no one who could really fit into your, into your category. So you might have expertise, you know, you, you might want to go into something, but if your PI doesn't have expertise, your PI can't help you in the method, if your PI can't help you in knowing exactly what are the important questions to ask, that's going to be a detriment to yourself because you're not going to be able to learn as well from their, from their expertise. And then, of course, the high expectations, low expectations, that could come with anyone, you know, tenured, non-tenured, it's, 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 a, it's a culture of the lab, of the, of the faculty, and if you're with someone who's pushing you very hard, and you don't, you like to work on your own, that's not going to be a good match. But yet, if you're bad with managing your own, or not, not, not bad, if you're, if you're not, not as, as good about managing your own time, or keeping on track of things, or you need someone to be pushing you, you need that pressure, to actually move forward, then you should probably go with someone who has maybe a bit higher expectations, be more, more interested in exactly what you're doing um, on a more day-to-day -day basis. Okay. So say that you found all these labs and you know that these are the you know people that you want, you talk to them, all that. So how do you actually start the process? You know, that's part of what we're what, what we have to do and part of what we're all these for. Well one is make making the initial contact. Um, Start early and be persistent because um, we're all very busy and faculty are you know, usually much busier than, than we are. So it's very easy for an email to slip from you know, number one on the inbox to all of a sudden by lunch, you know, number 60, 70, 80, 90. So if a PI does not get back to you, that is exactly, you know, all of you know this, um, if a PI does not get back to you, that does not mean that they don't want to talk to you. If they get back to you and say, I'm sorry, we're not taking any more students, that's saying, I don't want to talk to you, um, or I'm not, uh, I'm not available. Um, but if you don't get an answer, you should follow up. I mean, not necessarily if you don't get an answer in you know, six hours, but if you email someone and you don't get an answer in a few days, maybe you might want to send a follow-up email, just you know, re-expressing your interests, asking if they have you know, time to, to, to meet with you. Um, 
and then you may need to you know, follow up again. But if this is someone who's really worth it, then you might, you might want to consider sending several emails if you don't ever, ever hear from them. You could also try you know, office hours or knocking on the door. Sometimes people are very busy, or they might just be out of the country. They might be at a conference somewhere, and you didn't know this. Um, so that's, that's an important thing to know. In terms of making initial contact, email is nowadays usually the easiest, fastest way, most simple way. Um, you could do you know, door, door to door, you know, going to their, to their office um, if you're lucky enough to catch them. Phone is also another elusive thing if you're lucky enough to catch them at a point that they're able to answer their phone. Um, so that's, that's how to make the initial contact. Then once that happens um, and you actually meet with them, you speak with them, then some of the next steps to do um, will one follow up with, 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 with a meeting. I mean, you, you had one meeting, you talked about all these different aspects of what you're interested in, what they're interested in, what they do, what you like. Um, but that's just sort of a, it's more like an informational interview actually. You know, gauging what the, what, what the scope of, of what the lab does and maybe see if you could fit in. But after the first meeting, you probably want to schedule a second meeting to not only talk with them a little bit more seriously, but also to meet a lot of the students who are in the lab and maybe even attend a, a group meeting to see how the dynamic of that goes. Um, and, to, and to just be able to, to meet more people, learn more about the lab. And um, really then, then after that, it's, um, if, the, if the match is right and you both feel that, feel that connection, then it's time to negotiate the, uh, the funding and joining and conversations about you know, what requirements there are and what your project may be and, and all that. And again, apply for fellowships because that is very, very important. Um, so with that, we have our, our, our three faculty panelists um, with their, their wonderful pictures up there. And uh, based on the questions that, that all of you asked, and um, questions that I've also gotten in, in previous versions of this seminar, I have a few, few points that I'd like to, to start the, the discussion with. And you know, feel free to... To, to chime in if you have more questions or want to elaborate on, on certain things. So I, I guess you know, we could start with the, with the first question on this, um, which is when should students bring up their funding requirements, course requirements, and actual project topics? Do you want me to start off? Sure. <laughs> okay. Um, so I guess I think the first thing that I would say is that um, Different departments are going to have different cultures with regard to answering this question. And even listening to, to Daniel talk, um, I think the particularly the arrangements with funding can be quite different. So coming from AeroAstro, from an engineering department where pretty much 100% of our graduate students are funded, and uh, funding is actually not grants are sort of not difficult. RAs are not difficult to get at this point. It's like it's a it's a good time for funding. So uh, we tend to make our funding decisions early on. So with that in mind, and that is sort of the background, I would say you want to start talking about funding and specific projects early on, immediately, because for many of the faculty in my department, the constraining factor is not funding, it's the time and the size of their research group. And um, so, so I think it's good to be upfront. I mean, I would say generally, I think it's good to be upfront and bring up these things early anyway, but it may be that in some departments in, in science, more science labs, it, it's, it's a little bit different. Um, you know, the same thing with the, the question of the actual project topics. Um, Daniel gave a, a great overview. Every lab is different, every advisor is different, and each one of you are different. And it's not about right and wrong, it's just about different and, and figuring out uh, where you're going to fit. And so talking about project topics early on, getting the sense of how fixed a particular advisor is with what they have in mind in their group, how narrow a group is, this is how broad it is, how much flexibility there is. Um, I think it's really important to get that sense early on because it's sort of a matchmaking process and, and you want to, to get as much information as you can early to decide whether this is something, a group that you really want to pursue and learn more about. Yeah, and if, you're, uh, if you don't have funding, if you're from a department that doesn't have funding and you need to find funding, I would say it's not necessary perhaps in the first email to, to say I need funding <laughs> because it, it may come across like it's just about the money and not about anything else. So I think from your point of view, in that first email, uh, you, don't, you don't have to mention the funding. I mean, if the, if the um, faculty member is, is um, 
uh, is having difficulties, he or she may respond immediately by asking, do you have funding? And whether or not you have funding might be the end of it. But if, if the response from the faculty member is not bringing up funding, then it's helpful to go on to meet and to talk about the project. And part of this is that it's a good uh, first step in your graduate education, which is just to learn what, what various faculty here at the Institute do and what project they work on, how they approach the project. So when you're looking through uh, discussing, uh, from your point of view, finding a lab, it's a good way of learning wh what science is going on at the Institute. So uh, that's, I think, important, and I think the, fa the faculty appreciate this as well. So, uh, so then, perhaps after you meet, after the second time, it'll become obvious when the funding issue is coming up. I think it generally is a, is a natural point. I think the same with the projects. Um, it can evolve. You want to ask the faculty member uh, what kinds of projects go on. You, you've you've, uh, uh, you've um, contacted that person because you have an idea you might want to work in the area that he or she is working in, but not necessarily in a particular project. You want to learn what's going on and, uh, and have that discussion lead perhaps to some project possibilities. Some possibilities the, the, the faculty member may have funding for and some uh, of the projects that might interest you. So uh, this whole landscape, in this whole landscape, you want to be talking, I think, to a few faculty, again, just to learn what, what goes on at the Institute. I would compliment that by answering the last question, uh, or the second to last, how would you choose an advisor? Don't choose an advisor. I would choose several advisors for several reasons. One, we have recently had a faculty member die. Well, if you choose an advisor and that person dies, you're sort of left up high. So not only that, but if you work with more than one person, you're going to have a number of people who can vouch for you when you go out on the job market, when you go into teaching, or when you go into an industry. So having more than one person is very important. And this fly seems to like me. I don't know why, but anyway. Um, the related issue is, in our department, we have almost no funding. But that doesn't mean that we can't get funding. So if you have great ideas, you have great connections. Lots of times our students help us find connections, help us find, and so you know, go to the faculty, do something you like, be enthused about it. Don't do something just to do it. Do it because you really enjoy doing it. Be really adamant about this is something you really want to do and here's why. Look on the web, look elsewhere for what that person is doing or those people are doing. And go to them with, you know, you're doing this. Have you ever thought of doing this instead? That might be interesting. Well, maybe that will elicit an interesting discussion between you. It doesn't always, but it sometimes does Come up with your own ideas. Don't just count on whatever that person has down there, but if it relates to interests that you have, but basically do something you really want to do and can get enthused about it. Great. So say that the project is you know, a perfect match. The PI is absolutely, this is the advising style that I want. And a student is thinking, this is the place I want to be. How should the student express that they are committed, you know, this is it, I, I, I want to join? Uh, and maybe how should they, should they do that? Should it be over an email? Should it be in person? Uh, um, so I think email is, like you said, perfectly acceptable these days as a form of communication. The one thing I would say is always be professional in your emails. If you're not sure whether to refer to the professor by their first name or by Professor X, then Call them Professor X, but don't write hi there or you get, you know, pe people will go to extraordinary lengths to avoid using a title in an email. So just be very professional and if you're not sure about where you should be aiming, then be more formal rather than less. I mean, I always tell students, you know, please, please call me Karen. If you don't get that invitation, then, then continue to be a bit more formal. 
and um, you know a nicely worded email I would be very enthusiastic to join your group um, you know whether you whether funding has come up or not talk about the projects keep it brief and, and conclude with you I'd like to meet with you to discuss it further so um, for, for me an email would be would be the preferred the professionalism thing. also goes I've sometimes called people back because there's a phone number there and I called them back and I get this ritzy ditzy tune coming back <laughs> you know clean up your <laughs> your messages that you have on your machine for people to call you back because something like that maybe it will go over well with That's some true. faculty with some that will immediately put them off so it may be okay for your friends but when you're dealing professionally with people you don't want to have them. No, I, I would agree don't call me by my first name so that, that also varies a lot so it's as, as you said um, start out by using a, a title normally in this environment here this culture professor so-and-so and then again if you're invited to go by first name then by all means uh, I think also um, it's it's quite it's fine to ask for help of the advisors of the person you're speaking with in other words if you you think you want to work for that person you're not sure don't I wouldn't say don't hesitate to to send them an email that uh, you would appreciate some additional advice in, in trying to resolve a few issues I think you can ask for advice the faculty are there to help you uh, I think certainly that leads on to the, in, into the fact that you, you don't obviously don't want to come across as sort of as a know-it-all uh, you want to resist saying that you spent two years wherever you were before working on a project and it's a great project you'd like to continue it in this person's laboratory right? <laughs> you want to keep an, your mind open to what that the, the person is doing uh, and, and this is the kind of thing that I think um, can be handled effectively by email but don't hesitate to, to ask for advice to, to be helpful and in fact even in the subject line and coming all the way back to that first email in the subject line you can put um, need advice for thesis work something like that because I think um, virtually all the faculty will respond to that they want they're here to help we're all here to help you so mm -hmm. so don't don't hesitate to ask for help or have an important question and you seem to be the person <laughs> who can answer it you know so yeah. you come to them with a question because you research what they're doing and that elicits an interchange but again, I, you, you do also, I mean, I think we're all giving advice based on our own personal styles and preferences. Keep in mind, everybody is different, and um, hopefully you've done your research. And if it's a faculty member who doesn't respond to email, then sending them an email to tell them you want to join the lab is probably not the right way. So hopefully you'll have some sense. You can get this from talking to the existing graduate students. Is it better that I drop by the lab at midnight and try to catch Professor X or Y or send emails? So you, you want to tailor your response to the person you're dealing with as well go to that person's class and sit in on the class and after the class walk up and say yeah. you know what you're talking about is very interesting to me da, da, da. Yeah, that's very good. so I, I think we could probably group the next two two questions together because they're very relevant so uh, what makes a student a successful fit in a lab and related to that is it okay to join a group from a department which is different than your background you if start, you start are parents, interested by all means no, good, please. Well, no, I mean, yeah. do something you really like to do, whether it's in your line or, you know, if, it, if you really have something there you want to do, do it. Because your enthusiasm is going to spill over to the rest of the lab. Yeah, well, part of the, the second piece first about your background, I think Daniel's perhaps the best example. Uh, his own doctoral thesis work is on spinal cord regeneration. Now, when he came to MIT, I don't know that he knew much. He was motivated. He had a personal motivation to work in spinal cord, but didn't know. I don't think he knew anything about spinal cord. And he's, he's working in spinal cord regeneration. So he was very much out of his background. I don't even recall. I'm sorry. I don't even recall what you, did, what you might have worked on as an undergraduate. It, it was um, organic electronics. Organic. <laughs> there you are. <laughs> so, you know, part the, the education here is to educate you with a new background <laughs> so you know that's the whole opportunity is to is learn something new so I think from that piece I wouldn't you know I wouldn't be concerned about it unless it's pretty clear from the project you absolutely need a certain background to, to get started so 
I think as far as as far as the fit and what you're looking to, I, I have to say, I'll tell you right now, it's a warm, fuzzy feeling. <laughs> it's what you cannot explain. It's just what feels right. It what feels right when you walk into your the the, the, uh, the faculty member's office. If it seems to put a smile on your face and a smile on his or her face <laughs> when you walk in the office, that's pretty good. That's what you're going. If when you walk into his or her office, you're getting like tense <laughs> and your jaws clenched, and you're like, then then you you know it's not so much fun, right? Mm -hmm. and, and this has got to be a really enjoyable experience to be rewarding in the laboratory. So that that a lot of it is just you can't explain. It's what feels good to you, I think. Many of you seem to be from other countries. At least you're, uh, and many of you seem to be non-white. Well, you know, search out faculty who have interests in other countries, who have interests in minorities, who have interests. Search those people out. You can find out from their website a lot about how they feel about those things. You, if that's something you want to relate to, then that's a way to. Uh, so on background, um, I agree completely that it's, oh, graduate school is the most wonderful time because it's the time you get to learn and create yourself and then recreate yourself. And hopefully during your career, you'll also have an opportunity to learn and move into new fields. But certainly in graduate school, it's just an amazing time. So take advantage of that. Absolutely. Be open-minded. Um, you might think you want to work on one thing, and who knows what could be around the corner. But I would say just be careful to set yourself uh, up in a situation where you're not going to fail. And by that, I mean if you are moving into a new area where you don't have the background, you want to be very clear on what the expectations are from the faculty member in the first semester. Are you going to have a first semester to get up to speed, to take some classes, to maybe sit in on some undergraduate classes, to do the reading? If they're going to expect research results in the first month, then moving into a different field is probably not, not such a great idea. And do you need a different language? Maybe you have to take a language class. Do you need more math or science? Then maybe you have to take some more math and science classes. But I, um, I have to say, when I recruit my own graduate students, I mean, I, I look for diversity in background because that's a great way to have a very vibrant research group. And I have students that come to my group that don't have the sort of official training they might have. I have students who have done master's degrees with other people and have come to me as PhD students with not quite the right background, but, but that's fine. They bring something else. Um, and then the other sort of flip side of moving into a different area is, uh, keep in mind, you gave the example of lasers and you said talk to your friends in ECS, but I look around, certainly the engineering school, and I see the departmental boundaries between what is mechanical engineering, what is aeroastro, what is electrical, it's getting more and more blurred. If you're interested in biomedical engineering, there are probably six departments that you could find somebody in at MIT working in that area. So just because you're admitted or you're in one department doesn't mean you can't seek an advisor from outside the department. And I know it happens, but I don't think it happens nearly as much as it could sort of on an intellectual basis that um, often faculty amongst departments are actually intellectually much closer than faculty within a department. So, so be, be, be open-minded in that regard too, I think, when you look. Okay, so actually very, very related to that. Um, maybe for, for someone who has quite a broad research interest and one faculty member may not be exactly what they were, what they were interested in. Um, in terms of the scope of their, their research project. Uh, how would this play into choosing a, a co-advisor? Or what, what, what wisdom do you have for, for the students on when it's appropriate to choose a co-advisor or how to go about choosing a co-advisor? So actually, uh, Professor Polinski gave one opinion about having multiple advisors. I'm just going to give you another perspective, and that is um, when it comes to co-advisors, I have not had that much success with it, actually. Um, I guess there are different kinds of co-advisors. You could be co-advised by a research scientist or a postdoc in your faculty member's group. And that sometimes happens, um, particularly when you get to the bigger groups and more senior faculty members. And, and, and that may be fine if that's a model that works for you. But co-advising with another faculty member, I have found in my own experience, it almost always starts off as co-advisors and then winds up being one advisor and you know, one not so much an advisor. I think you can interact with other faculty members through your thesis committee. They can be sort of informal advisors, but 
for me at least, it, it works better when the student has, um, you know, has more of a single advisor and, and expectations can be sort of communicated simply. But again, that's just personal experience. Um, yeah, I, I think I would agree uh, as well. And it just means uh, the, the responsibility for your education and training has to, has to be clarified. Who, who's the, where does the buck stop? Who's the person really responsible? So that when you get your thesis defense, you have to know you have a real advocate sitting there who's going to make it work, who's made it work through. It. And, and it helps to identify that one, that person in particular. I think the, word, the, the term co-advisor could mean many things. A collaborator, mm -hmm. somebody who, who helps out, certainly. And that's good. I mean, it's good because it gives you uh, the opportunity to meet and work with other faculty, not just one faculty member. But I think it's, it's um, useful to have in your own mind the fact that there is one person who is your faculty supervisor, the person who's going to sign off on your thesis. And I think that's that's helpful to clarify. And uh, but it, it's, it's certainly great to have other collaborating faculty and working with you. Right? I think it depends a lot upon whether or not you know, a lot of the people I work with come from other departments. And I would never be able, for instance, I work very closely with chemical engineers. I'm not a chemical engineer. I don't know that area. It'd be silly for me to advise a student on the chemical engineering part of their dissertation. But the economics, the regional planning, so on and so forth, that's fine, I can do that. So it depends upon how isolated your field is. And then, but if you're cutting across fields, as many of our students do, then it's very important not to depend on just one person. Mm -hmm. But it's true, the buck stops with whoever is the faculty in the department from whom you're getting the, from which you're getting the uh, degree. They have to know the rules and regulations. Yeah, so I'd actually like to emphasize the, the point of uh, forming your, your thesis committee. Now this is something that you're probably not thinking of, of right now, but really your, your thesis committee is essentially a group of your advisor and a bunch of informal advisors that have in some way, shape, or form um, knowledge about different aspects of your project. And since our, our, our work sometimes covers many different fields, it becomes very important in those cases to have advisors um, and at least some of the members, because you can think of them as, as co-advisors, who are experts in the individual parts of your project. Because not only will that help you flush out problems that may come up, um, but they'll also be your, your advocates, and that'll make your work that much stronger. And they'll be able to speak for the, the strength of those aspects of your work. And then when it, when it comes um, later on, when you're looking for jobs and other opportunities, now you have a variety of people who are in your network who come from those different areas because maybe by the end of your thesis you realize you know, the thing that you started in wasn't necessarily where you want to go and now you've expanded your network to go into multiple uh, different areas. And the, the, the same goes with, with collaboration. So many, many times your collaborators end up becoming part of your, your thesis committee. But um, I think my advice would be to, to find an advisor who really sits at the basis of your work. So if you're doing, for example, materials work, uh, but you're applying it to all these different areas, you know, energy or um, you know, medical problems or, or whatever, your principal advisor should be someone who could talk to you about the material, so as a firm grounding in that area, because that's going to be the main emphasis of the project. And then you could get other people um, who would be your, your sort of informal mentors or, or you know, informal co-advisors who could help you with the other aspects of, of, of the project. Um, so I guess the, the last prepared question that, that, that I had from, from this group um, it's uh, a little bit of a, a, of a touchy subject for you know, someone joining a lab, but say all of this really doesn't come to fruition at the end. You join a lab and it's really not what you thought it was and you don't like the culture, you don't like the advisor. How should you professionally remove yourself from that, from that situation and, and go on to, to find another position? <laughs> I don't think anybody wants, uh, carefully, very carefully, <laughs> you want to do this. Uh, 
but actually, I tell you, every de I, I'm sure every department has um, people there, uh, administrators who deal with graduate students who have a lot of experience with a lot of the faculty in the department. So oh, I would use those people as resource. And um, so I would begin to look to get their advice. First of all, express what, the, what you feel the problem is. Sometimes they can work it out. Sometimes you know, they can work it out with you or they can work it out with a faculty member uh, to sort of be an arbiter of this. Uh, if not, they can give you good advice of how to proceed. Normally what's done in that department to, to switch advisors. I think as with just about everything, it's important to be as open and honest as possible it, from the beginning. Uh, everybody here is here to help you. And, and they want to help you. And it, things don't work out all of the time. It's just not going to happen. So people are prepared for these kinds of difficulties. And there are ways of handling them. And everything works out well afterwards. So uh, you know, I, I, I think it seems like it's a forbidding issue. But on the, on the other hand, there are ways that it can be dealt with. Don't stay with somebody with whom you really can't work. Change. Find out a way to change. Get out of that situation as easily and rapidly as you can. Because it's going to stay with you for a long time if you don't. So get into something that you can feel. Now, in some fields, it's easier than in others. In some fields, it's almost impossible. There's only one or two people working in a certain area. So you have to sort of think. Sometimes it requires changing schools. So you have to get out of the university you're in and into a different university. But don't stay in an unpleasant situation if there's a way out. Yeah, I, I agree completely. Uh, if a situation is, is unpleasant, chances are it's only going to get worse and, and you know, eventually culminate maybe in you not finishing a degree, so dealing with it. Um, I agree, it's very good advice to take advantage of the resources. So the graduate administrator in your department uh, as a resource and then, I don't know the structure of all departments, but in our depa department, the uh, associate department head, which is actually uh, me at the moment, I have oversight of the programs and so I will commonly meet confidentially with, with graduate students who are having trouble with their advisors and, you know, listen and see if there are things that I can do to help. And so you, you should absolutely feel I would hope that there's somebody in your department um, in that role with whom you could talk confidentially. And then of course at MIT there are the Ombuds office, um, there are a lot of even resources that sit above the department, so ask for help. And then ultimately if, if you're unhappy and you're not doing well, um, I think there's probably a really good chance that's not going to come as, as a big surprise to your advisor when you tell them you want to leave. That um, I've had students who have come and it just hasn't worked out. It's very obvious to me it isn't working out and I'm trying to figure out a way to sit, sit them down and tell them I'd rather not keep them on and the best outcome is when they come to me the week before I'm going to have this discussion with them and say Look, it's not working out, I'd like to move on. So I know it can be hard and it can be overwhelming but chances are you're both sort of reaching this conclusion that it's not working out and um, again just being honest, being professional is probably the best path forward. It's almost remarkable there's not more of a problem with this because you're the, this, the uh, graduate student thesis uh, relationship, thesis advisor relationship is really unique. I mean, you're having a relationship with a person for five years, generally, four or five years. Sometimes I mean, more. Sometimes <laughs> more. Just think back, think back for a moment what you were like four years ago. I mean, of the change that you've been through in four years. Now try and think ahead in five years. Are you going to be the same person that you are now? I mean, you're going to go through changes. Well, the faculty member also is not I'm, I'm, I'm going to change in five years. So both people are going through this change personally and professionally. And the thought that you're maintaining a working relationship that is not only professional but friendly <laughs> Uh, is is really uh, um, remarkable, and it's it makes it so satisfying. Actually, it's the whole process is really a satisfying process. I mean, that's why I think that's why we're here, right? That's Absolutely. why that's why we don't work in industry because it's really <laughs> great. I, I honestly, I think graduate students are more like children than they are employees, and it, it's hard. It's like being a parent that 
you have to sometimes be really tough and there are things that are not easy and um, it's about professional development and personal development and there are you know days when you're mad with your, your parents I and mean, it's the same thing with your, your advisor so it's it's not easy and, and you both do change a lot five years is a long time um, but I think the neat part of it is that the bond particularly with PhD the bond you form with your PhD advisor is it's unlike probably any other professional bond that you'll have so. and you'll maintain it for the rest of your life you're going to be coming to that person because you're going to want to get a job then you want a promotion then you want an award yeah. then you want so you're going to be going back to that person over and over and over again so just graduating is not going to break that bond okay um, well that's all that we had uh, prepared in terms of questions so I wanted to open up the floor uh, to see if anyone in, in the audience um, had something that was a pressing question for them that they'd like to answer. Good. It's uh, kind of the idea of your ideal lab size. First, like how do you go about just on your side deciding what that is, and then how flexible do you think of that is year to year? And if someone comes and it's someone that you thought would be a really good fit, but you're full in your mind, when you kind of what's your thought process? Yeah, that's a good question. I can take my ideal number of advisees is probably around six, uh, because then I really could spend the time I wanted with the students. My group is usually more like twelve. Um, I have a hard time saying no because there are so many great research opportunities out there and so many great students. So for me, I I'm constantly trying to get my group size down, but constantly there are great students and good things to work on. So you know. Um, even though I know I'm overcommitted, if a really great student that shows up that's got passion and enthusiasm that I think will be a good fit, I would tend to say to say yes. And that's why even if you know, even if nominally a, a faculty member says they're not taking students on, if you have an opportunity to, to get and, and talk to them um, without pressuring, I, I think it's a good thing. Yeah, I think this speaks to lab size, just as was said. Uh, so I think um, we both adjust our lab size relative to how many students we can meet with as necessary even weekly if necessary and that really adjusts it because I personally I want to be involved in the research <laughs> the research is fun so it, I don't want to I want to be involved in it uh, so on the other hand there are some labs that are three times the size of our labs and in that case there are several postdocs uh, who may have been around several years, who then provide the day-to-day -day or weekly interaction, whereas the faculty supervisor might meet monthly. And in that faculty supervisor, uh, it's a bigger operation, and he or she derives pleasure from running that kind of operation. Now, from your point of view, it's, it's an adjustment. It's a question is, what, what, where do you feel best? Do you want to be meeting with the faculty supervisor? Or, on the other hand, do you not mind working with a seasoned postdoc and taking quality time, the use of quality time with the faculty supervisor maybe once a month. So, so it's, it's a, a different setting. I'm, I wouldn't say one is better or worse. It certainly, it, for me, it's better <laughs> because I want to be involved. So, so that's a good question and that, that's an important question actually to involve. Now, in our department, we don't really have labs. We have research projects. We have studios because we're in architecture and planning. So the architects have studios. And those can be quite large. The Beijing studio, for instance, they take maybe uh, 10 people over to China. So some of this also depends upon what you do with the people. Those of you who are international and want to have international experiences, then look for those places where the professor will go with you, singly or as a group, to a country. A lot of the professors in my department do that. I've taken people to China, I've taken people to Brazil. Um, you know, this is important experience to be able to work with the faculty and fellow students in the field. So it, the size is not so important as what you're doing with them. Also a good question. <laughs> uh, you wanna, 
I mean, it, it, my own, for, um, I, I really don't see much of a difference, actually. Not really. Uh, it's recent because of the, the people in that category are, are really good <laughs> and smart and just they operate like faculty. It just so happens the rank is different. <laughs> Uh, and um, but I think generally I would say there's probably not so much of a, a, a difficult a d difference, you know. And really, okay. yeah, I would I would ask all the same questions. You know, what, what's the funding situation like? Is it stable enough that I feel comfortable making a commitment? Um, you know, is this person the right person to help me move on in my career? So there are principal research scientists here at MIT who outside are regarded. You know more highly than 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 yeah. faculty here, so I, th I think yeah. it depends. But absolutely, we have amazing principal research scientists um, mm. here. At Sometimes you will find that there is no funding available, but you, through some way, have independent funding, and you really want to do that project. Go to the person and say, "Look, I am not here for funding." I'm here because this is what I think I could contribute. Can you use me? Sometimes for me, I say no, my time is just not available. But you know that does work once in a while. The other thing is that sometimes the younger people will have new skills, new ideas, new ways of doing things that those of us who have been in the field many, many years just don't have. So that may be a reason to work with the younger per person rather than with tried and true professor. What factors would affect how long a student take, would take to graduate? <laughs> <laughs> good, good question. <laughs> Funding is part of it in our department. Oh, is it? yeah. Uh, I, I never think funding. The, the question, <laughs> do people understand the question? Mm -hmm. Maybe you want to mm -hmm. repeat the, qu the question. Sure, so, so, mm -hmm. so the question was what factors go into how long a student takes to graduate? I mean, I, I would say the advisor. You just take, take some data. It's a very measurable outcome. Find out how long the students who in the last five years in that group have taken. And um, of course, there's a lot of variance. There are things that happen in a student's career. But my observations is that different faculty members have different, have, tend, to, tend to have clusters. Some labs, it's seven years. Some labs, it's five. And I think that varies also with department Absolutely. as well. So I think you'll you'll get a sense from department to department. Uh, um, but it's funny how that's another thing that just seems to work out. <laughs> it just it always just seems to work out. Uh, and I would say this: if you're having if you happen to be in a project that has gone on for a few years and uh, hasn't generated much data, perhaps as you might have wanted, and it, it seems like in the last year or two, <laughs> next year or two, all of a sudden you get a lot of data. In talking with your supervisor, you can adjust what the goals are, and uh, then it, and it works out. It, it really does. So uh, it's an important question, but one that unfortunately it's sort of it's it's hard. It's not a contractual relationship. This relationship. That's the thing. You don't sign a contract that if you do this, this, and this after you know, five years you'll, you'll get out. So, but it does work out, that's, that, that's not okay. And just because people have spent a long time doesn't mean that that's a bad person to work with. Because sometimes, find out what the people did. Did they use data that were already collected or did they have to go out and collect their own data? Did they have to go out and, you know, and that takes a lot of time. So that in and of itself is important experience that will help you when you get out of the job market. So if I can add one more thing. Um, often that question is asked and we're all thinking, oh, you know, being a grad student forever is a terrible thing. I have to tell you, uh, being, a, being a PhD student particularly is one of the best times of your life. <laughs> Never again in your life will you have so much flexibility, so much time. You think you have a lot to do, trust me. <laughs> It's, it's just going to get worse. An opportunity to go and take classes. You're at a place like MIT where you can do a minor in, I don't know, the Sloan School or in geology. If I could do one thing differently, I would probably tell my, my advisor who's now department head, take a, an extra year to do my PhD and actually take additional classes and learn more stuff. We're in such a rush to graduate. So I would say, I mean, obviously within reason, more time is not necessarily bad because it is an incredibly rich learning time in, in, in your life and um, 
yeah, don't don't be in, in too much of a rush. The other the other part of it I saw in your your guide, there's a there's a statement that says, well, I have to TA. Again, it makes it sound like being a TA is a terrible thing that you only do if you're completely out of all options for funding. When else in your life are you going to have a chance to learn to teach and to interact with some of the smartest undergrads in the world? So maybe taking a semester to TA might help you figure out whether an academic career is for you or whether you're into, you, whether you enjoy teaching. Um, again, if that adds on half a year to your PhD, it's, it may be worth it in the long term. So. And a lot of it will depend upon your family situation. If you're married and have children, it's going to take you longer probably. And that's not a bad thing. You know, I, one of my students took quite a long time, but he had two sons in the process, and he spent time. He wanted to have time with his family, so he spent time with them. He could not finish as quickly as others, but that's fine. You know, he had a very good family situation. So take those things into account. Talk with your advisor about why it's taking you so long. Sometimes advisors don't know that you have all these family obligations or you have parents that you're trying to help or something. Let your advisor know that that's taking up a lot of your time and let them help you in making decisions on how to juggle it. You also mentioned funding as a factor for that affects the how long these things will take. The funding? Funding? I think you mentioned that funding affects how long these things will take. Well, if people have funding, they should finish sooner. But they don't always do it because often the funding gives them the luxury of going into other things. And that's sometimes good because then you find new job opportunities, new ways, new interests. Oh, you're interested in music. So you spend part of your time, because you have the funding, you spend part of your time doing something in music, which MIT has not encouraged you to do. This. So what, what it really comes down to is um, mostly personal, um, mostly personal motivation, uh, interest. Because really, you could if you came in and were just gung ho on finishing the PhD and took a safe thesis topic and wanted to get out of here as fast as possible, there, there are people which have made it through PhDs in in three years. Um, some of them are now faculty members at MIT, but um, they, they basically, you know, the, the people who come in and are very motivated to finish and stay that way, not because you may be co coming in motivated to finish, but you may not mm -hmm. find yourself in that position, you know, two or three years later. Um, those are the people who usually finish the fastest, or if they're motivated at the end, they say, okay, I've had enough time here, you know, it is time to really push through and get this work done and talk with my committee and push, you know, this is my end date, this is my, you know, proposed end date, you know, this is the research that I'm doing, you know, here's the plan that I laid out, are you on board with this, all of that. But sometimes you may want to not push yourself that, that harder, just as you said, you may want to explore more, more options, you know, learn about the different areas of research or different activity, you know, different hobbies, different, Things that are that are important to you, or maybe you know you, you start a family. Maybe even starting a family is a reason to get out sooner because maybe you know that if you're, you know, if, if you're having a child or your spouse is having a, a child, then you know if your clock is set at you know nine months and you're almost done, you may want to finish or try to finish before then. So I think the the time to finish is a very personal thing and. Yes, you could you could look at the you know mean mean or median time that a certain group has to, to finish, but that is highly variable um, depending on the, the, the individual. I think I think also this is one of the many areas in which you want to trust and feel like you can trust your faculty advisor, your supervisor. So um, you can trust him or her to know when it when it's right. Free day for you to finish. Personally, I still remember the day my own thesis supervisor told me it's time to finish. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll, I'll sort of never forget that because I, I, you know, I was enjoying it, and I, I, I don't know, I, I, it was very difficult for me to understand the framework in which I was working time-wise because I enjoyed it, and I remember when he said. Okay, let's finish up. 
So, you know, you can just feel like you can trust, trust him or her to, to deal but with But be certain to let your advisor know what the situation is. I remember one of my very, very bright male students just didn't finish, didn't finish, didn't finish. And I couldn't figure out because there wasn't much for him to do to finish. I found out later the reason he wasn't finishing is he was from Turkey. And if he finished, he had to go back to Turkey and enter the army. So he was delaying finishing so he wouldn't have to go back to Turkey to enter the army. He didn't tell me that. And it was very frustrating. So be in communication with your advisor so they know why the, the delay is not because of lack of something up here, but it's because of the circumstances facing you in your personal life. Well, one attribute that I don't bother looking for is how smart you are, <laughs> because You're I don't smart. bother. Oh, I'm sorry, yes. Sure. So, so, so the question was, are there any specific attributes that you look for when you're, when you're taking a student into your lab? Yeah, that's a good question. So as I said, it's not, I don't, I would never look at the transcript even. I just, I, right, I just, you're all here, so you're all smart enough to do the work. So for me, it's motivation. For me, it's also finding the right fit. If I, you know, if I, I try and discuss with the student, how, how he or she really feels. And if the, if the person feels, I get the sense they feel this is the right project, then I know they're gonna be motivated. And beyond that, beyond that, in large part, because as I said, um, you're gonna change so much personally and professionally in, in five years. I don't, I, I personally, I don't have any judgment about uh, or is somebody outgoing or not outgoing. Is somebody, uh, um, or something about your personality because you're going to change. And part of, the, part of finding the right lab and supervisor is to find somebody who's going to bring out the best in you, to help you, <laughs> to help you change in a way that will bring out the best in you. So, I, 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 um, so again, it's nothing specific for me. It's not like that. Yeah, I, I, same thing. I mean, sometimes you just, you just sort of it's the feeling you get when talking with the student. I will say one thing that's become more important to me over the years is communication skills, um, particularly written communication skills, that um, you sort of get to the point where you've rewritten enough theses <laughs> that it, it, it becomes, it's, it's a hard thing to spend, to spend time on. So that's something that I, I look for more now than I did when I first started on the faculty. Um, but yeah, enthusiasm, motivation, uh, the right blend of independence. It depends on the project. If it's a team project, I'm going to look for someone who's going to be able to work with other people on the project. If it's individual, that's less of a concern. So, Have them meet with other members of the team so that I have research team. And if I'm hiring somebody, I want that person to fit in with other members of the team. They may be bright as hell, but if they don't fit, it's going to wreck the whole team. So, and that's nothing you have much control over. It's something which you just have to take as granted. Did you So, so the question was, is it appropriate to have um, your potential advisor, right. or be, okay. So, so, so be involved in the process of applying to to various scholarships. So, as a, as a recommender, if they know you, if they're the best person to write the recommendation, I mean, I would separate out the choice of recommenders from the project you're hoping to work on, because recommendation letters are such an important part of an application that it's, it's very important that you choose somebody who knows you well enough to give a very detailed and thoughtful assessment of your, your, your abilities and your strengths and weaknesses. 
Um, so if, if it's somebody you're hoping to work with in the future but they don't know you, I don't think I would choose them as a recommender. I, I, I think the, the question more was, was not as, as a recommendation, but should you approach a, a faculty member who you're thinking about working with, um, with, let's say, a, a, a proposed project that you're writing a fellowship application? So, so should the prospective advisor be a part of writing the state, like the statement of objectives, like the right, like the statement of object, uh, sorry, objectives. Yeah. So, um, I think it's again, it depends on how well you know the person. I, I think it's fine to ask any faculty member to give you feedback if you're writing an application for graduate school elsewhere or for a fellowship, to give you feedback on the statement of objectives part of it. But I guess to come and say, could you help me craft essentially a research proposal? I, I, if I didn't know you, I would, I would find that a little unusual. But again, I'm not sure if it's different in science and engineering. Uh, no, th this also is a good question insofar as um, there are definitely students who, are, who, who may have taken a subject I, I've taught and I've met with them outside the subject and I've gotten to know them pretty well and, and uh, um, they, they would like to uh, apply for a fellowship on a topic and then perhaps whether or not it gets funded, maybe work in my lab. And the funny thing is um, it takes a lot of time to, to deal with to deal with formulating the proposal, the subject. And sometimes, uh, uh, most of the time, uh, the student I have full confidence in can do anything, but it's just what they're proposing. <laughs> Thinking about proposing, I, I can't get into. It doesn't resonate with me. I, I think I see some problems with it. So that's okay, but now, if I'm starting to get involved in helping them write it, it turns out to be my proposal you know, it's just, it's hard to help somebody and then not take on your own character. So it's, it's I, I don't have a good answer actually. It's, yes, you're doing, you should contact the person and, and ask them to what extent they can help. There's definitely a middle ground. That is to say, there's an idea you have, I may be able to help you, you prepare the, t the thesis, craft the language, even though it's something that I wouldn't have proposed, it's something that looks good coming from you, and I think it can work out. So, I, I, but it's a it's a kind of a there's a give and take there that's kind of challenging sometimes. Some of it depends too, because I've had a case many years ago where a student came to me, asked me to write a recommendation. I had worked with a student before. I said, well, you know, I'm not going to be able to write a very supportive recommendation, do you still want me to write it? And they said yes. So I wrote the recommendation. Well, lo and behold, they were working with somebody else, and that person had a lot of pull with the foundation. And they got the fellowship. And I hadn't been on their committee. They came back to me and they said they'd like me to be on their dissertation committee. I said, but you saw the recommendation I wrote. and the fellow said, yes, you were the only one who was honest with me. <laughs> so based upon the fact that, you know, I hadn't felt very strongly for the person, they still came back and asked me to work with them because they felt they were getting the truth from what I was saying. So who, whom you ask is a very subjective decision. Do you enjoy working there? Talk with some people who are there, and if they, even under those circumstances, enjoy it, then go ahead. But if they don't, I would stay away from it. Yeah, I think you use the word supportive. Another word could be nurturing. 
some of us need to have that nurturing <laughs> environment. Probably I'm that kind of person too, would, would, would like to get the warm fuzzy feeling of people there I know who are supportive and nurturing, um, but that's just me. Uh, so I would rather be in that environment. Uh, so I, I, if, you're, if, it's, if you're sort of concerned up front about it, I, I can't say chances are it won't get better. It could. <laughs> because you, might, you may have only had a limited number of meetings with the faculty supervisor. And once he or she takes on the responsibility, they can change it entirely from your point of view. So uh, you might give them, uh, you know, some some additional time and see how that works out. But uh, otherwise, it is important to, to sort of know, get in touch with the kind of person you are and what what, what you need. That's exactly right. I think you have to ask yourself how important is that support for you to be successful. Can you be successful without it, or is it really essential to? who you are and what, what it is that you need to do well. And then, you, you know, you could also ask, does the supportive environment have to come from within the lab itself? Or is there a very active graduate students association in the department um, or neighboring labs? Are there other ways? So talking to the graduate students that are there and finding out whether they're just people who don't need this kind of supportive environment or whether they have other ways of doing it could be a really good way to go. And thinking ahead to where you want to go in the job market if working in that sort of environment is something you really need for your job, then maybe you better do it even if it's not very supportive in and of itself. Because you're going to get training in what you want to do. But if it's not going to help train you in what you're going to do, don't do things you don't want to do. I mean, there's too many interesting things to do in life. Well, if there's no more questions, uh, I'd like to thank our faculty panelists again.